Uh, so, the topic of the <coughs> webinar today is really discuss with the American dream finally over for Indian students. And uh, it's being presented to you by Manya Princeton Review. And they've been good enough for, to invite us to have this session. So, thanks a lot, uh, folks, for inviting us to have this session out here. And what I want to do in this session is answer your queries at the end of the session. But to begin with, I wanted to give you a picture on what's reality and what's just put up fiction. Separating facts from fiction is what the intent of this webinar is really all about. Okay. Before I get started, I just wanted to introduce myself. This is all good to get to know who's person speaking. And on the other side of the laptop, which is me. Uh, so I'm Ankit Mehra, I'm one of the co-founders of Kandhan. Kandhan is India's first education financing marketplace. What it really means is we started this company two years back, and we are on a mission to make higher education easier for students. So what we want to do is get to a stage where students can get loans on the basis of their merit, and students who are applying for banks do not have to go through the hassle. And so over the last one year, we've helped over 150 students get more than 40 crores in loans through our partners. And I'll leave the comments for you guys to read the customer feedback. But the intent for us is really how can we make this process easier? And how can we bring transparency to the entire education loan process? As for myself, as I said earlier on, I'm one of the co-founders of Gyandan. From a background stand, I did my undergrad from IIT Kanpur way back in 2007 and then joined Capital One, which is one of the top 10 banks in the US. I worked in Capital One for close to six years. So I've been a beneficiary of the H1B visa and uh, actually I've asked people to join my team on the visa, B visa as well. And then in 2013, I decided to move to Spain and pursue my business school studies from ESA Business School in Spain. It's in a city in Barcelona, so any of you, eventually if you decide to do your MBA, that's a great place to be in. But and it's during my business school studies that I decided that, hey, can we make use by learned Capital One to make a fundamental change in the education financing industry. And at this point in time, today I'm speaking from two angles. One, I'm speaking from an angle of a person who has started a company that provides loans for higher education. And two, I'm also talking from a potential recruit because we have a US company and we would be hiring for that US entity as well. And so I'm also gonna talk from a recruiter's perspective in this session. But the first thing is what is more crucial in terms of providing loans. And the reason why I say that is crucial is because the reason you need to understand is if a bank gives you a loan, they make money only if you return the loan or make the loan repayment. From that standpoint, a bank's interests are very well aligned with your interests. So it wouldn't make sense for a bank to not look at this entire H1B issue and just give you a loan. Right? So that's really the context in terms of who I am. Now, uh, these are some news clip clippings I've seen over the last three months float around, uh, which has really been the crux of the situation where people are spooked by whatever they've seen in the media. Whether it be, hey, will we even have a future? What happens when the H1B visa will actually go What is Donald Trump doing? I mean, is it a case then I cannot get a job anywhere in the US? Or if I spent $60,000, $70,000, and then I have to come back to India, is that a new reality? Or what? And that really forced a lot of students to rethink their thought of going abroad for higher studies, specifically to the US. And we have had many students who reached out to us saying, hey, I'm not planning to go to Australia, I'm planning to go to Canada, and all this stuff. At least my advice, and I've just done a similar session previously as well, but my advice to students is more around 
you should think of Australia and Canada as options, or UK or whichever country you're looking at as options, in isolation. What I mean by that is that there are certain universities or certain courses you like, sure, go ahead and offer those courses. But do not base your entire decision on hey, what's actually happening in the US. Because I can tell you, as we go through the session, there's a lot that's being reported in the media. It's actually false or incomplete information. It's not false, it's incomplete information. You need to be able to understand that before you make this decision in your life. Because this will be one of the biggest decisions in your life. And so you need to be clear about what the truth and all this stuff. And now really, how did we get here? So we got here because there was a session, there was a US election, and a person called Donald Trump got elected to the White House. And the first thing he did was he signed an executive order which prevented people from certain nationalities to enter the US. And that really set the fire in the forest so in terms of everyone got put in terms of what will he do next? What else is in the sequence will be impacted? And really what we need to understand all this stuff is this is very, very different from whatever is happening with the international student scenario. The first thing before I get started on anything is this piece. The media is not a reflection of reality. And more so in today's day and age. Because what's happening today is we are living in the age of social media. And what that means is people look at whatever is on, whatever is on their Facebook feed or on their Twitter feed and think that that is reality. But that is not reality. Unfortunately, even the Print media is guilty of actually showing you only half the news. And you need to understand it because the media needs to sell content, and that is the business model of media. So if you were to give you that picture and say, hey, everything is normal for international students, obviously that's, just, that's not exciting. Where it becomes exciting is if they say, hey, now you have suddenly n number of students who won't get a job after their degree. That's when it becomes exciting, and that's when you buy the newspaper or click on the media. And some of you might be familiar with the next slide, Mr. Frank Underwood from House of Africa. But really, the key in all this thing, and this is just not restricted to HLB or the French issue here, but broader, always pay attention to the fine print. Because what really happens. Uh, what's reported in the media might not be true. And I'll give you an example of this. Nowadays, if you go to online websites, uh, if you scroll down at the end of the news, a lot of times you will see this information was sourced through online feeds. And we don't check the veracity of this. Now, what that means is I can post an article somewhere and in times of India, could pulling that information and posting it on their website. Now the fact is, if Times of India pulls my information on their website, suddenly my information gets credence. You start looking at it and thinking that that's credible information. Well, it is not, because all I was writing was from the confines of my room without any information. All right? So I've been giving a lot of what I like to call gyan. Let's talk about actual stuff. Actually, what's happening is there are a lot of bills that are on the floor of the house in the US. And think of it similar to the Indian system, where what happens is someone proposes a bill, and then there is a debate, and there are multiple steps before the bill actually gets enacted. All right? And that is where we are at right now. A lot of legislators in the U.S. are proposing bills saying we need to fundamentally change the H-1B policy. But the key thing is they are all bills. And on this slide, rather than going through the details, you can look at there are multiple steps before the bill gets developed. And there are multiple roadblocks here. 
The thing I like to call upon is why guys need to look at the table at the bottom, wherein only four percent or three percent of the bills actually get enacted. So it's not like everything that starts off gets enacted eventually. It's only three percent. So small. Now, at this point in time, there are at least at least five bills on the floor of the house that have something or the other to do with H1B mods. And really, right now, I'm focusing primarily on the H1B. I'm not talking about the OPT or the other things, because really, for a lot of us, if you about HRDs, the objective is: Do I get a job or not? How do I pay for the education? And that's what H1B is critical. As I said, there are at least five things, five bills on the floor of the house. These three people, the what I like to call musketeers, are the three key people who proposed bills that are currently very active. Okay, and I'll talk to through each bill in detail, but I'll please highlight the key elements of each bill to explain what the bill actually tells you. And for this, I'll just give you a brief background about H1B for people who don't know about it. So the way H1B is, is at some point in time in the US, they realized that they were did not have sufficient high skill laborers. They didn't have a sufficient number of people graduating in STEM courses, let's say. And they need to attract people who can help us to our industry. And that's when the visa came about. I mean, they said, hey, if you're a high skill worker, you'll get an ability to work in the US. You can also live the American dream even if you're an international person. And that was the rules. After a few years, what they ended up saying was, hey, we need to establish at least a base salary to exhibit that the person is high skilled. And at that point in time, what they had set out was $60,000 is the base salary which qualifies you as a high skilled lady. That's the context. The U.S. government every year issues out 65,000 H-1B visas. Actually, it's 65,000 65, general H-1B visas and 20,000 specifically for the master's program to attract high skill labor from all across the world. But in the early years of the H-1B process was the number of visas was much more than the number of applicants. But in the last I would say 15 odd years, the number of applicants has been far more than the number of people. And that's when the lottery system came into place. Because if you have 65,000 visas and you have 200,000 applications, you need a way to determine who gets the visa and who doesn't. And they decided that H1B should be a lottery system. Now these three guys are opposing different aspects of the bill. But fundamentally, whether it be these three guys or everyone else, what everyone is fundamentally attacking is, hey, what is the definition of a high skilled labor? Does a normal human being who gets a bachelor's degree, does he or she qualify for an HMB or not? Is he or she highly skilled or not? That is the fundamental thing and the fundamental question. The first guy, Dan Isa, rather than going to the bill details is, and I would encourage if you guys are interested, you guys should go to the website and look at the bills. Because when you go to the bill details, that's when you realize what the truth is. So the key highlight of Darren Isa's bill is he's saying, hey, the $60,000 was set back in 1990, then 2017. That 60,000 number needs to fundamentally change. And he's saying we should at least set it at $100,000. That is all that he's asking about. Again, I put numbers at the bottom saying what are the bills actually getting enacted. Because that's another key piece that, hey, I could start a proposal in the parliament just because I want media attention. But does it actually get passed? Does it have the support of all the parties involved to get passed? And the chances of this bill is 1%. Charles Grafley, 
He is the veteran when it comes to visa reforms. He has been against H1B for a long time. But in his bill, he is he's saying hey, this lottery system thing does not work. So he's saying, hey, if an emphasis wants to send 10 people, they can apply for 25 visas. They don't really care about which 10 people get. Whereas someone like Google or some other company, they have identified the 10 people they want to hire. And then they are at a risk of losing certain candidates. So he's saying that there should be some kind of a preference system for all these lotteries rather than am I lucky on a certain data part. And the third bill, which has the best chance of getting passed and it's at a gross number of 3%. And this is actually, to be honest, the most interesting bill of all three. She talks, Zolo talks about a lot of things. But three things which I like to highlight are, one, she's saying ESA should be reserved for startup and small employers. So what she's saying is, even if I don't have the money, so as a business or as a Google, I have the muscle power to hire employers and kind of fight this battle. But as a startup or as a small company, if I need access to high skill labor, I need to have some visa reserved for me so that I don't have to spend a lot of money. The second point is very critical for all you guys, students, is she is talking about removing visa hurdles for students. But the second main about this is, so in one of the discussions, Soul of Gray mentioned, and what happens right now is if you go to a visa counselor uh, to apply for a visa for the US, for the F1 visa, you cannot say to the visa employer, hey, I want to settle down in the US. He says that's right. If I'm going to the US to see high studies, I am planning to stay there and work there. So why should we have this notion of I cannot say this to a visa counselor because my visa will be rejected. She's saying all this dubious practices should be removed. And then, point of her bill is essentially see, she is saying we should do country level caps when it comes to the path to permanent residence. And this is very, very important for Indian students and Indians in general. So, what happens right now is if you apply for a green card, and by the way, when I was in the US, my green card. I never applied for a green card because I knew I was not going to stay. And if I stayed in the US for a long time, it would take me at least 10 years back then if I, before I could get my green card. Whereas my colleague from France could get a green card in one, one and a half years. What she's saying is if you're really talking about promoting talent, there should not be any country level caps. So next year, you should you can get a visa, and then eventually you can get your green card purely on the basis of your merit. Not have to do with the fact that hey, I am an Indian or I am a French. All right. So these are three bills, broadly speaking, that are on the floor of the house. And if I look at all these three bills, whether it be Carol uh, Lisa's wages, whether it be Charles Crossley's preference system or whether it be Zolo Prince broad policy. All they are saying is they need to rationalize this h policy. None of them are saying we need to completely stop the h program. They are just saying we need to rationalize it. And just before I get into that, one, uh, get into what does rationalization really mean. What is the proposed preference system? So I told you that some of them are pre proposing that we should do away with the lottery system. So there are two proposals right now. One is we should have a bidding process for h one b visas. But the slide I have out here is the other program that they have proposed. And really for all of you who are planning to pursue higher studies in the US, you can just look at it and realize that this is actually going to be pro students. Because the number one on the list is anyone who is taking an advanced degree in STEM courses from a U.S. Institute of Higher Education. 
And now, how is it grow? I'll give you the example of that. Last year, there were 65,000 users. If there were 200,000 applications, your chance of in for one fee. This year, if this was inactive, and now you're applying for an H1B in the US, guess what? You're not, you don't have a one in three odds, but you're right at the top of the pecking order if you are doing a one degree step. Um, thanks, Haley. All right. So that, that's what is the pecking order. And there are different wage levels when we talk about non immigrants and skilled field wage levels. That's really talking about someone in a, let's say, a senior manager or a present role. When their salaries are at least 180,000 above onwards. So if I look at this, really what all the all the legislators thing is, who do we want to target? Well, we want to target the outsourcing or the IT services company. And why is that? I think this slide completely explains the entire picture and issue that I saw right now. So what happens is a US company can also apply for an H&B. The IT services companies, which is Capgemini, Germany, Cognizance, Tata, can also apply for the H&B. The difference is these charts actually show the base distribution. So if you look at the middle chart on the top, which is Tata, what it's telling is that seventy three percent of the people who are working with Tata on an H one B visa are getting paid between sixty to seventy thousand dollars a year. And why is that? For those of you who are listening by the starting, because the base for an H1B is 60,000. So what these guys are doing is they're paying people the minimum salaries and employing them at those wages. If you look at the chart to the uh, uh, charts on the bottom, what you see is what you would expect if you had done uh, any course in statistics or any course in engineering, that normally things should be in a bell curve, a normal distribution is a bell curve. And all the companies are following a bell curve, where the median is at least over $100,000. It's actually close to $120,000 in most cases. And here you only have the tech companies, but I can tell you the simplest story is applicable even for other companies. I worked at Capital One. I can tell you about the financial industry as well, but the chart will be the same. And now what? Maybe you are, can you put yourself on mute? Avi, can you put your phone please? All right, thanks. Yeah, so the key thing here is, and that the reason why this is very, very important is, 70% of the H1B visa are used by the companies on the top. The companies in the bottom all put together, and the other US companies don't make more than 20% of the H1B visas. And now what these guys are saying is, let's attack these guys. Let's change this case where a person with just a bachelor's degree, having no skills, can come and work at a really low salary in the US. And we are depriving the Googles, the capital one of the world, the wealth fathers of the world, from employing high skilled people. That is essentially what all the legislators are talking about. I combine this with the previous slide. What you will get to is that what happens is if these legislations actually get enacted, it will actually be beneficial for international students in general. And again, from my standpoint, I am completely in favor of these bills getting enacted. I think. This makes a lot of sense in, on multiple levels. The one thing that was very, very critical in the last few days, or actually now it's been a couple of months by now, 
was that there was a lot of media reports and I saw n number of Facebook posts where it was the new salary range would be one thirty thousand dollars and above. Again, this is incomplete information which the media houses get up. The proposal even on that front is that the 130k salary should only be uh, applicable to what is called an H1B dependent in the world. And again, if you look at it, what an additional H1B dependent employer is, it is companies that have 15% or more of their employees on H1B. Visa. And which companies have 15% or more of their employees on H1B visa? Well, the Indian IT outsourcing company. That are paying salary to $60,000. So again, what these guys are again saying is, if you cannot change with the market, so what happens, if you look at the, these charts, let's say 10 years back, the, face, the Apple chart would still have been a bell curve, but it would have been a bell curve with a median somewhere in the 100k range, but now it is at 130. So what this is telling is, hey, they have adapted to the market, they have changed their salary expectations with the market. Whereas for a Tata or for a Cap Germany, that has not happened. And what these guys are saying is, let's force them to do this. That is, either these companies will have to fundamentally change their business model, and given that that can, might not happen, the companies or other companies put together have a better chance at recruiting talent. So this is this is really where the truth and the fiction is set. In my mind, that everything that is happening at this point in time will actually eventually benefit international students or students who want to pursue higher studies in the US. The only person who I feel sorry for in this entire scenario is Mr. Donald Trump. He's done a lot of stuff in the last few months or maybe a year or so now. But one thing is, on this particular front, he's actually said nothing against H1B or nothing against this kind of uh, high skill labels. If you look at his quotes, these are these are tweets from Donald Trump after he announced his candidacy for the president. And I mean, if someone says, "I want talented people to come into this country to work hard." And to become citizens, Silicon Valley needs engineers. And then he says, when foreigners attend our great colleges and want to stay in the U.S., they should not be thrown out of our country. I think that fairly summarizes his stance on the entire issue. I mean, Donald Trump is definitely anti-illegal uh, immigration, undocumented immigration. He has issues when it comes to all his executive orders around people from certain countries. But on this particular issue, he has not talked against US's ability to attract students. And one of the reasons why I think that might be the case is because at the end of the day, he also understands that the US universities are well funded by international students at this point in time. As an international student, you will be paying out-of-state tuition costs, which are higher than the in-state tuition costs. A lot of uh, universities are being funded by the international democracy, and that's something they cannot go over, do away with. There are a couple of other things I wanted to discuss before I open it up for questions and address questions on your front. One was really, hey, Yes, I mean, I'm going to the U.S., but what if I don't get the required things? What if I have to come back? And that's something I really advise all students to do in terms of be very prudent about your fiscal planning, about financial planning. That is extremely important. So what really means is, first you need to assess what is the total loan amount you're looking for. And then, one of the things I would advise you to do is look at loan term. That is very, very critical. 
because I mean if you look at let's say 40 lakhs as an example what you're talking about is if you take a five year loan your monthly EMI will come out to be one lakh that theoretically should mean that at least you should have two lakhs of disposable income for before you decide to this loan versus if you change that to 15 years your monthly EMI falls down by almost half and that is crucial and it does not require you to make a lot of additional investments because I mean if you get a job in the US or if you come back to get a high paying job you can always prepay the loans all the banks we have partnered with have zero prepayment tenants so it does not matter whether you are prepaying your loan or not if even if you decide to you don't have to incur any costs so from that standpoint I would encourage people to think about what's the right loan amount length or tenure what we call that they need to take the loan for one additional thing which I have not highlighted here is the OPT bit because I would say back in end of January, early February, there were even rumors that hey, the OPT will come, kind of come under threat, or there is some leaked memo which says there will be no more OPTs. Well, again, that's one thing where I don't know who had a fun time trying to create a leaked memo, but we have not seen anything so far on that front, and. The reality is, for the STEM students, up until a few years ago, the OPT was only a period of one year. Then it increased gradually to 27 months. Last year, it actually increased all the way up to 36 months. So, rather than decreasing, the OPT period has actually increased significantly. So, that is the fact. The rumor is. And that rumor is completely unsubstantiated. So you need to be very careful about this. One advice, and again, this comes primarily because that's talking to students who are currently in the US and students who took loans from us last year as well. And okay, you need to be proactive in terms of your job search once you're in the US. And that actually is a truth, regardless of whatever happens in the current scenario. So the difference in the Indian education system and the US education system is that you can pretty much feel entitled that we'll get a job, that there will be a placement office that will do wonders for us. Whereas in the US, more of a that you are on your own, people will help you, but you should do your job on your own. And that's where I think the difference lies. People will be circumspect. But if you have the right skills and you show the right skills, US is the land of opportunities. It's a country that was built by immigrants. The way you the way you look at US right now, it was completely built by immigrants. It's an, the very fabric is immigrants. So that's not going to change a lot. I mean, I've, I've shared this previously as well that there are certain other countries where the anti-immigration sentiment or the laws are such that it makes it really cumbersome for you to go for higher studies there but that's definitely the case in the US. So to summarize I would say if you are thinking of other countries you should really be thinking primarily on the basis of the merit of the institution primarily on the basis of what you want but just the fact that hey there will be some legislation passed at some point in time and so I should that should not be the reason for you to not go to the US if anything you should actually hope that these legislations get passed and you should go to the US because that only increases your chances of getting a job after degree. I, before I end up I, I think the, the a beautiful quote because uh, why are people opposing whatever Trump is doing? Also, when he passed the executive order prohibiting some 
countries, people from some countries to come to the US. And this quote pretty much summarizes this very, very well. That we're trying to, what everyone is trying to see here, we need to have checks and balances in place so that people don't make misuse, don't misuse their part. All right. Uh, that's all that I had to discuss. Uh, we can now have a question and answer session. Thanks a lot. Um, to end up, I mean, reality is a product of the dreams, decisions, and actions. So a lot of, every one of you by, far, by now has had dreams of pursuing higher studies, of getting that education. Now is the time for you to make a decision and then to act upon it. And that is really where you will create your reality. Thanks a lot. For higher education, you can obviously reach out to us. Yeah. Well, basically, how do you compare with Canada? Uh, so the first thing is, what are we comparing? Are we comparing an EA? Are we comparing an MS? And even there, MS in which particular field? I think that what you guys need to understand is, I mean, when you go about preparing for your career, there are multiple things. One is what you are good at, what are your skills, and then what are the opportunities out of it. And that you should be different places. Because, okay, MS in engineering is the question. In which specific branch? Okay, broadly speaking, so I'm, not, I'm not that qualified to answer a specific field, let's say if you come back to me with petroleum engineering, right? But really on average, I would say US still remains the dominant place for pursuing higher education. And that's reflected very big rankings, whether it be when you talk to people out there, whether you see the research quality being done, or whether you see the job opportunity. U.S. This is the predominant place if you want to pursue higher education. The benefits with Canada, benefits that Canada has, I will address that. Canada, the benefit is the path to residency is much easier. There are hurdles per se, and that's why I think I like the Zolo train. Uh, proposal that it also removes the hurdles of permanent residency. But that's one of the benefits or attractions when you look at Canada or Australia as places. And in terms of value of education, so how you are called, what you're calling in terms of value. But in terms of the quality of education, for sure US has an amazing quality of education. If you talk about what your colleges. In terms of the return on investment, again, if you get a job in the companies that I mentioned on the lower list, hey, you're going to repay your loan fairly quickly. Or you're going to repay your education fairly quickly. And your trajectory will be significantly. All right. So two interesting questions. So one is Somnath asking, after completing MS, MBA students need not really worry about stability of jobs. Once they get hold of, it. yes. Once you get hold of a job, should you be concerned about stability of a job or not? I would say it would be similar to hey, you have a job in India. Should you be concerned about the stability of the job? Or not? I was in the U.S. on an H-1B. Frankly speaking, for me, it was the same thing as for a U.S. citizen working at Capital. There was no difference in terms of how we were treated, or in terms of how company thought of, of problems. There would be kind of minor upheavals every now and then. There could be that. But from a stability standpoint, I don't see any issue. You have to keep showing your potential and keep working on your skill set. But if you are doing that, then yeah, companies will reward you for your merit. Seema's question on what will I see out in America and recent happening, especially for Indians. 
Uh, I've now been, I've not been to Australia and the East, East of India, but I've been, I stayed for a couple of years in Europe. I worked in London. I've worked in the US. I, I can tell you that much. But, uh, US is the least racist of all the places I've been to. Now, there is a dis US is pretty big. There are differences. So, I mean, there would be pockets in the US where you can feel that racism in the air. But if you're talking about the cosmopolitan areas, if you're talking about the San Francisco, the New Yorks of the world, well, in Texas, I would say Dallas. I mean, I've been to Dallas, so I can say that. That's not that, that relevant. The racism is not in the air per se. Now, what there have been some. I would I would acknowledge there have been some recent uh, incidents, unfortunate incidents in the U.S. There is no denying that. And really, I mean, I can't really comment on that in terms of what will happen after that. But you can see that those have been condemned by rank and file. It's not been a case where. It, Donald Trump has said it is fine and all that stuff. Everyone has condemned those incidents. And some of it much the idea that because it's so hot, you might be seeing some racism topics being covered in the media more than if you had the same incidents happen like five years back or four years back. Because as I said, when I was in the US, yes, there where you go, you can feel it. But those would not be covered because it's not the flavor of the month. Right now, the flavor of the month or the flavor of the season is how can you show any sort of anti non American per se? But the reason happening is the cause of concern. Again, the US system is pretty well ingrained and pretty well established to take care of all those issues, in my opinion. But yes, definitely don't don't plan. I mean, I wouldn't say don't, but uh, if you go to a remote location in the U.S., yes, then you can expect racism. The beauty of it is, as students, most of you would be going to universities where there will be a significant class population, and you will be living in college towns. So not be really looking in a city. You'll be living in a town is essentially being run or it's like the quota of India, I would say. when the very industry is students. So there again, uh, chances are that you might not face racism to the same extent. So I can't comment upon uh, comment comment on specific universities. I think there are people much more qualified than me who can comment on specific universities. I think you guys can reach out to uh, if you, if you have questions around test prep or if you have questions on ad admission consulting. And I think this question on MIM might be a good question. I think folks from Mania would be much more equipped than me to handle these questions. But in general, when it comes to management graduates, there is a great scope. Uh, Suraj, could you please put yourself on mute? Thank you. Yes, so for management graduates, the scope is immense. I, I think there was a, re I, I don't remember where, but I was just looking at some report a couple of days back when it was talking about Amazon, Apple, and uh, there was a third company recruiting management graduates, and their chart for recruiting manage management graduates were like completely critical. They were increasingly hiring more and more of management graduates. I want to pursue MS in data science, and I'm considering Ireland. What are your thoughts? Well, three aspects. Again, I think the Mania system review guys might be. Well, well equipped to handle that question from 
my perspective, I can say that yes, data science is a great field. I mean, I'm looking for data scientists at my company. And uh, MS in data science is definitely a great place to be in, or great degree to do. Uh, as, as far as Ireland is concerned, I think you will have to do that research on your own or reach out to the, the folks. My advice generally is, if your plan is to pursue higher studies, you should probably reach out to seniors or to alums from those institutions, and they give you a clear picture on what are the pros and cons. But data science in, in and of itself is definitely a great place to be in. Next few years. And yeah, sorry, sorry guys, but I mean, I'll purposefully not tell you questions, uh, I'll purposefully not answer questions around the other country, Ireland or how is MIM from Southern Methodist University. Because frankly speaking, if I start giving my gyan on those things, that it really is the same thing as what I am against. So what, when I'm telling you this, I am trying to tell you that, hey, people just get half information and that becomes news. And that is an issue. That people don't look at, people look at the 130, they don't look at the entire thing. And they make it a news just to sell it. And if I were to do the similar stuff for you guys, give you half information, I'd be falling with the same bit. I'm sorry I cannot answer those questions specifically, but my, my best advice is you reach out to the Anya Princeton guys, you reach out to your seniors, Alums, and they should tell you the truth. Any other question, guys? All right, so how can then help finance the education? Uh, so, so yeah, so uh, lot of people, uh, first slide, and I'll just give as I say, so Gyanthan is a financing marketplace. And what it really means is we are working with different banks. So we have brought different banks on our platform. And there are other, so there are two aspects to it. When we started off, we said that, hey, can we make the process simpler and can we make the process smarter? So what happened was a few years, a couple of years back, getting a loan without security was not possible. Or even if you reached out to a public sector bank, you could get only loans up to 20 lakhs. And the best thing is, which a lot of you will realize if you have admits, is you get an admit from a US university, before you get the I-20, you have to show proof of funds. But Indian banks would ask you for an I-20 before they gave a loan. So it's a chicken and egg problem. The university wants financial loan before they give the I-20. The bank wants I-20 before they give the loan. And that's why it never worked out. So things like that, things like, hey, if a student does not have a property, but he's a smart student, can he or can he not get a loan? Those are places where we've worked. So we've developed an uh, algorithm that helps us predict employability of students. And using that, we have partnered with three banks right now, which is State Bank of India, Access Bank, and uh, Bank of Baroda. And we are trying to make the entire process simpler. And I mean, you asked in terms of how do we help in financing? So we are providing the benefits of a bank without hassles. And you can pretty much read the first comment here in the italics, which is, Gyanthan helped me get my loan sanctioned 
from the very same people who initially refused me without looking at my case. This was a student who went to a bank on his own and then went to us and got the loan from the very same branch manager. So what happens is once you check your eligibility online, after that, a particular loan counselor is assigned to you. He or she will start the process at a bank with Sophia. In this case, we have three banks. We will see which is the bank that is best suited for you. So which can get you the loan in the right time, right trick. Once you start the process at that bank, we will then ensure that we are there with you throughout the entire process. So if the bank official is telling you, sir, bring these five documents, when those five documents are not required, at that point in time, we will ensure that those documents are not necessary. And we tell the manager that, hey, this is not necessary. You should get the loan sanctioned without these documents. So pretty much risk, reducing the time it takes, reducing the effort it takes. And then with Access Bank, last year we started a product wherein now we are giving loans up to 30 lakhs get an education loan without security. How long does it take? So, varies, but once, let's say if you have all the documents, then for a loan without security, it should take not more than two weeks. For a loan with collateral, it should take not more than three weeks. But the key here is, once we have all the documents, I mean, the fastest we have done is two days as well, but that's one of those cases where it's, uh, it's an exception rather than the general timeline we convey to the customers is two weeks for an unsecure, three weeks for a secure. And the loan counselor that I was talking to you about, he or she will also ensure that they, any issue you have, even when you are studying in terms of your loan, that hey, the bank is not giving the money, but not that creating this other hassle. Those are also taken care of by the end. We do Pan India, as I said, so I get 150 students in fall 2016. That was all across the country. So we are we have an office only in Delhi. We have this location in Delhi. And if you guys want to, I, I'd already shared the websites and stuff. Uh, we operate on an online fashion. But right off the top of my head, I can think of I'm the remote. So we've done, last year we did a case in Jammu Kashmir in the north. We did a case in Tamil Nadu in the south. In the East, we did not go to the Northeast, but we had a case from Kolkata, and the West, we had a case from Gujarat. So I think we had, except for the North, Northeast, we had the entire area covered last year, and Northeast was also a case where we didn't receive an application. And the clear thing is, if we cannot get a loan done, we will be upfront about it. If we think we cannot get help with your loan process, we'll tell you that, hey, we can help you, some other person can possibly help And we'll even tell you who could possibly help But the clear thing is for us is there should be transparency in the entire process. Any final questions? I'll give another 30 seconds if people have any other questions. Uh, 
I'm not sure about that. Uh, do you want to take that? Will they get the PPT? The PowerPoint. All right, guys, uh, given that we don't have any more questions, thanks a lot for taking time out today. Uh, thanks a lot, Hitesh and Manya Pilsu, for allowing me to interact with the students out here. And if you have any queries related to test prep or admissions consulting, please get in touch with the Manya, folk, Manya guys. And if you need any help around the financing, you can always reach out to us at Canada.